It's great to see such a good collection of people here today to um, hear Caroline McGuinness. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Margaret O'Callaghan. I'm acting director of the Institute of Irish Studies. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have Caroline here today because much of her career as an undergraduate, uh, as a PhD student, and as a postgraduate uh, was as a brilliant product of this university. <laughs> We're thrilled to hear that she has just been promoted to a readership in the University of Salford <laughs> as recognition for the remarkable work that she's done over the past decade. It's really exciting to have her here today, not just talking about Milkman, though that does come into it, because um, Milkman is possibly the most important political text written in the last 30 years, in my opinion. But, <laughs> and uh, so the title she's going to speak to us uh, today on is Moving Through Milkman, the body in motion in some recent Northern Irish texts. So I'm absolutely really delighted to have you here. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for that um, very kind and, and, and generous introduction. Um, and it means a great deal for me to be back here uh, in Belfast. I think a lot of my colleagues who work on much more sort of exotic um, literatures of the world get to go to um, much warmer climes than I do. But um, a few times a year I get to come home and that's really lovely. Um, it's also very special um, for me um, to be presenting this paper in front of both sort of my PhD supervisor from Queen's, but also my new PhD um, student who's at Salford um, but lives in Belfast. So it's sort of a nice, um, a nice kind of a homecoming. Uh, so as, as Margaret said, I'll be presenting on the idea of the body in motion or, or movement. And I will be focusing uh, almost exclusively on Milkman with a discussion um, of, of a few other um, texts as and when they're relevant. Um, what I'm going to basically, the, the sum total of, the, of this paper is arguing that something different happens with the body. Um, and I'm going to be using what might at time appear um, some quite unorthodox um, sources um, to read through some of these ideas. This is um, quite uh, an experimental um, kind of out there paper for me, um, but I work with a lot of colleagues who focus on um, movement practice, kind of somatic theory, the body and movement. And I've really been um, energised and, and galvanised by them um, to take some risks. So this is either going to be great or an object failure. Um, so I'll let you um, decide um, at the end. So Northern Irish culture then, um, we, I want to think about what is the relationship of Northern Irish culture to certain ideas of, um, of mood um, and of feeling and how motion might begin to disrupt some of those ideas. Now, I don't want to say per se that um, I know that around the time of sort of World Mental Health Day, there's all of this, you know, you'll be fine um, if you just go for a run. Um, I don't want to sort of espouse that kind of, you know, kind of um, neoliberal help yourself um, logic to mental health. Health. But what I do want to say broadly is that movement in Milkman changes things and it changes the atmosphere um, and it changes the atmosphere, I think, in really interesting ways that are quite instructive um, to what's going on broadly in Northern Irish culture. So the aim of this paper is really to think about the ways in which contemporary texts negotiate um, the past through movement. And the way in which we traditionally um, discuss these texts is rightly in terms of fatalities, casualties and the ongoing crisis of mental health in Northern Ireland. Now, there's another element that's less tangible, though, and it can't be quantified in terms of statistics. But fiction in the 21st century, I think, really attends to now, if you think, for example, of the pervasive mood of a text like Owen McNamee's Resurrection Man, and you don't think about the shocking acts of violence, but you think of the ways in which that text is, quite frankly, ominous and builds up this, this kind of picture, this affect of this picture of feeling. I'm almost tempted to use a very rhythmic language for this creation of atmosphere. We think about it. We know it when we see it. We know when a text almost kind of pulses um, with this kind of downbeat, um, downbeat feeling. 
Now, well, there's no doubt that emotional life has been a concern of critical theorists for centuries. It's clear that there's a renewed interest in what we can loosely call affect theory. Indeed, um, in the forms of the affect, um, Eugenia Brukema says that, is there any remaining doubt that we are now fully within the episteme of the affect? Now, people have talked about emotional life and feelings since, you know, obviously Raymond Williams galvanizes a lot of this work. We think of everyone going back to the Stoics, but there's certainly new energy around this. What what does it mean to feel in the 21st century? Now, in Depression of Public Feeling, Anne Kvekovic accepts that the terminology when we talk about mood and feeling necessarily bleeds into each other. She says that terms such as affect, emotion and feeling are more like keywords, points of departure for discussion rather than definition. So I want to stray into that. It's quite often called in Milkman mood. People were moody, people got moods. And I want to think of how Burns break, brings up that, that picture, that kind of mood that she creates in the text, but then punctures it with movement. That's really what, what this paper is going to be about today. Because physical movement is foreground as a key bellwether of these forces. Um, indeed, they entirely disrupt the life of middle sister and cause her physical and mental harm. Now, in Kvekovic, in, in her book on depression, she refers to the use of the term public feelings. And she uses that to discuss an academic project at the University of Chicago. And she looks at sort of the mood that followed September the 11th um, and the Iraq war. And she weaves her own personal narrative of depression in with an attempt to capture this depressive mood on the political left. Now, this is important because what we're interested in here today is the relationship between the overall mood of Northern Irish society created by the author and then the representation of individual emotional states of their characters, how the collective feeling interacts with the individual. Milkman, in particular, meditates directly on the idea of public feelings such as shame, fear and disgust. Like we have um, um, middle sister say, there was now a feeling in the room to which nobody was admitting. Unpleasant, ominous, grey. She often talks quite overtly. And when I think of this, I think of the, the sense of foreboding that you get in something like um, Willie Doherty's non-specific threat, where it was noted that this work indicates a general feeling of danger. Um, and Burns has middle sister quite often meditate on this sort of general feeling. And I'm quite invested in how particular affects or, or moods are managed and broken um, and how this might um, relate to sort of wider questions of the Northern Irish body. Now, I'm not going to suggest um, that sort of Northern Irish people are the only people who sort of um, lack the words of the terminology um, to describe some of these affective states. But I'm going to argue that the heightened pressure and attenuated circumstances of prolonged civil conflict change priorities in the emotional language that's available. And I'm going to discuss the ways in which that is changed within the text. So I'm going to discuss, um, as I said, um, sort of the, the body in motion. And I'm primarily going to discuss um, running, dancing, and bear with me, yoga, um, as ways in which we can change the way that the body operates in these very negative um, spaces. <gasps> Because where the body is affected by negative affect, the body is also shown as the way out of endlessly circulating negativity of social and family trauma. So, in probably the most often quoted passage um, from the novel, um, we, we see Middle Sister kind of meditating on what it might mean to live in this society, where she says, at the time, aged 18, having been brought up in a hair-trigger society where the ground rules were, if no physically violent touch was being laid upon you and no outright verbal insults were being levelled at you and no taunting looks in the vicinity either, then nothing was happening. So how could you be under attack from something that wasn't there? Now, this is the difficult bind of feeling that she finds herself into. She can feel that something is wrong, but is unable to act on that feeling. Indeed, she regularly, the text brings us back to the, to the, to the inability um, to speak and name some of these feelings. I spoke of feelings even less than he spoke of feelings. I mustn't have believed in any of that all along. Now, one feeling that she does have access to is shame. And part of the reason is that shame is often conceived of as a public feeling. Shame needs 
others and you need to feel shame that you have done something against the kind of the, the, the kind of the body public so we were told that I didn't know shame. I mean, as a word, because as a word, it hadn't yet entered the, the communal vocabulary. Certainly, I knew the feeling of shame, and I knew everyone around me knew that feeling as well. In no way was it a weak feeling, for it seemed more potent than anger, more potent than hatred, stronger even than that most disguised of emotions, fear. At the same time, there was no way to grapple with or transcend it. Another thing was, is that often it was a public feeling, needing numbers to swell its effectiveness, regardless of whether you were the one doing the shaming, the one witnessing the shaming, or the one having shame done unto you. So shame is by definition a public emotion which is particularly corrosive to an individual sense of, se of self-esteem. Now Kim Mitchell um, is about to um, release a great book with Edinburgh um, University Press where she talks about shame. But in some of that earlier work, she describes the function of shame in contemporary writing where she says that shame returns us to our bodies. It is an incontrovertible ground of physical and affective experience. Shame is internal, individual, personal to each of us, while also being a feature of the external social relations that connect us to others and take us outside beyond our solipsistic worldview towards some encounter with the other. And it's that what I'm interested in, which is the idea of shame as this emotion which is conceived of, of being particularly bodily. Because middle sister does not have language available to her to describe the emotions or her body. Now the thing about it is she clearly knows what she wants and doesn't want to do with her body when she says, you know, not my fault though, not my fault either that I didn't find him attractive. Whenever she talks about somebody with somebody, she is so clear of what she is feeling sexually but but sort of lacks the, the terms and the phrases um, to describe this. Whenever I think of this text, I think of it being of someone who is very aware of their own body, who is, um, who is is running, who is reading, who is aware of what she wants sexually, yet finds herself ground down by the dominant affective mood um, within the text. Indeed, she says, it's amazing the feelings that are in you. And what I'm interested in is what has been lost whenever all of these feelings are um, alighted and ground down. So it's this tension between knowing yourself and feeling in um, public and how then that that feeling that mood that dominant mood in society then affects the way that you relate to your body now here comes the bit that I said in Salford and everyone was fine with it, but I'm slightly worried that everyone in Queens is going to look at me like I have two heads. So this is the bit where I'm going to start talking um, and thinking around um, movement and, and, and how we can think about the specific things then that we can do with our bodies to kind of get out of some of this trauma. Now, whenever um, in an interview in Vanity Fair, um, Anna Burns was asked what was the one book that was most influential to her? And everyone thought, she's going to say, you know, one of the books that's in the text, she's going to say some kind of big, heavy um, 19th century novel. Um, and she said, um, Light on Yoga um, by BKS Iyengar. And I'm interested, really, really interested um, in this. Like she describes in the interview that whenever she was nine, she went into the library looking for Agatha Christie's, but instead came out with this book instead. Um, and what happens when you go in for Agatha Christie's and, and you come out with a yoga book instead? And Iyengar Yoga, um, she describes the, this style as the toughest, most techno-nonsense yoga guy of them all. Now, there's a real um, emphasis in Iyengar on alignment, on things being absolutely precise. What I'm also interested in is, during the Troubles, um, who had access to movement and what kinds of movement were done um, acceptably? Well, we have, um, whenever she talks about anger, she talks about it being something that she could do on her own because if your access to the outside world is limited, how do you move your body and how do you engage your body? So for the nine-year-old um, Burns, this, th this, this was it. Th this text that she found was it, and we hear. 
Instantly, I was entranced. I brought it home that day, knowing it was something different from anything in my whole nine years of life up to that point. I'm sure it was. I am also practicing yoga, I'm, and I'm sure she didn't necessarily know this at nine years of age, but it also does involve going against some of the strictures of um, the, the Catholic Church. Um, a priest from Derry stated his belief that the practice would open one up to Satan and the fallen angels. Um, and the Vatican's chief exorcist referred to it as satanic. It leads to evil, just like reading Harry Potter. <laughs> now, um, what do you get then when, when, when you turn towards this? And she talked about in particular um, how the practice gave her um, a real relief from her anxiety by bringing her into a meditative state where she says, my anxious child mind decided everything had to be done just so. Now, if we look at the date that, that, that Burns um, was having this encounter, this is sort of the early 1970s um, in Northern Ireland. We know that the, the area um, that, that she was brought up um, in Northern North Belfast. I actually have a whole bit here where I explain to my colleagues um, in Salford what North Belfast was like in the 1970s, but I don't think you need to hear that necessarily. But if you think about her living in an area where the politics of going outside, the politics of traversing the neighbourhood are very difficult, the idea of having something that was heavily systematised, that she could do at home, where she could claim ownership of her own body, I think is something um, really significant. Because a similar precision is evident in Middle Sisters' relationship with her own body as well. We all see her regularly talking about control. We see her talking about this sense of um, awareness. Importantly, we also witness the same sense of joy that Middle Sister finds in the French teacher and the shiny people within the text, where she says, where Byrne says, I did go to it in the early, in the initial early child days with wonder, eagerness and love. And in the way that Burns writes about the body in Milkman, we can see directly the influence of someone who has had a bodily practice since the age of nine and has modified their practice throughout their life. This, but Burns also describes a, a softening. So if you think about someone starting off doing anger, everything has to be done perfectly. She then talks about how that practice stayed with her throughout um, the rest of her life, that... Looking back at it now, what was important and influential about this book, despite my growing gung-ho attitude to it, was that it brought yoga to me, that yoga came to me. It was just I had to learn through the decades how to appro approach my practice better, how to begin to understand really what it, all, what it might all be about. Now, I think this has a relationship to both elements of the practice within the novel, both the punishing routines, but also, in the end, an attempt to approach yourself with something that we might call self-compassion. Now, if I've established then that Burns as someone who is interested in um, somatic practice, someone who's interested in, in how the body works and, and how the body operates, um, I want to consider the sort of the, the low point of her, of middle sister's relationship with her body before we move on to some of the ways in which the body might, might get us out of um, some of these ideas. So in the novel then, physical symptoms of anxiety abound and it's often hard to locate precisely which part of the body are affected by which stimuli. I think in particular where she isn't sure whether her anxiety is because of milk, her, her feeling in her stomach is because of anxiety or because of the fact that she's being stalked. Um, she says, you know, I was being sick because mil of Milkman stalking me, Milkman tracking me, Milkman knowing everything about me, biding his time, closing in on me and because of the perniciousness of the secrecy, gawking and gossip that existed in this place. Now, Sarah Ahmed talks about the power of gut feeling in her feminist manifesto when she says, we vomit, we vomit out what we have been asked to take in. Our guts become our feminist friends the more we are sickened. But in this process, Middle Sister has gone far enough away from her body, that body that knew what she wanted and didn't want, to the sense that she's not able to locate exactly where in her nervous system um, this sensation is coming from. From her acute sense of her own body, she's been ground down to recognising everything as a threat. Also, this episode reveals the extent to which her bodily autonomy is mediated by women. Not only is it a woman who poisons her, but also the women of the community who act, who act to sort of give her medical care, where she says, therefore purging and guts out it became. 
Now, in the novel, we see men and women both susceptible to the physical effects of anxiety, stress and trauma. Now, following her interactions with the milkman, middle sister recoils into what she describes as an anti-orgasm. Now, if an orgasm can be described as a release of sexual tension in the body, this process is the reverse. As opposed to sort of a, a, rela a relaxed affect, there's a tense rigidity that affects her whole body, with the epicenter being her tailbone, which sits just below the sacrum um, and behind the pelvic cavity. This is how I'm going to get my good um, Welcome Trust Medical Humanities money. Um, and Middle Sister describes the sensation thusly. At the same time, I dismissed a strange bodily sensation that had run the lower back half of my body, during which the base of my spine had seemed to move. It had moved, not a normal moving as in forward bends, backward bends, at someone who does yoga, sideways and twistings. This had been a movement unnatural, an omen of warning, originating in the coccyx with its vibration then setting off ripples. Ugly, rapid, threatening ripples, traveling into my buttocks, gathering speed into my hamstring, from where inside a moment they sped to the dark recesses behind my knees and disappeared. This took one second, just one second. And my first thought, unbidden, unchecked, was that this was the underside of an orgasm. How one might imagine some creepy back of body, partially convulsive shadow of an orgasm, an anti-orgasm. Now she's attuned enough to her body to realize both the sensation of orgasm and also to realize this sensation as the opposite. Um, if we think about the, sort of where the, 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 the sort of these things um, are, originate, this is the same area, but where she's feeling this sensation is connected to muscles, tendons, and uh, to muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So here we see the influence of someone who is aware. Now, one of the things, um, particularly in yoga, and particularly in Iyengar, is there's a real interest um, in the sort of the positioning of, of the pelvis and how that relates um, to, to the rest um, of, of the body. And we also see middle sister aware here that her spine can move on sort of several planes and, and being very aware of, of twisting and, and shuddering um, and, and contracting. Now, Burns uses the word ripple 10 times in the novel and the word shudder 12. If a shudder is a kind of trembling convulsion, an involuntary contraction of motion, then we can see this sensation also and um, we see it um, within her father after he talks about um, his own sexual abuse, leading us to think about the generational legacy of different kinds of trauma. And we also see the, the poisoner also talking about shudders and ripples. It's clear that there's something happening to the body in this text that the only um, way of, of thinking through it um, is, is, is through these shudders. So if we think of this sensation of the anti-orgasm as something so physically specific and frequently discussed, but there's a real growing body of work that looks at the relationship of stress and trauma to specific physical areas. Now, probably the most famous of these um, um, is, is a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which looks at how kind of trauma work um, operates in really specific parts of the body. Whenever I thought about this, whenever I thought of the very specific rippling, shuddering sensation, um, I thought about some work that I had read on um, trauma-releasing um, exercises um, that the, 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 the one of my own um, teachers had, had been talking about. And this talks about using um, these sort of musculo, uh, musculoskeletal tremors um, to, um, to work with the body and to bring, what essentially these theorists do is they safely, in a controlled environment, bring the body into these kind of shudders that she describes there to kind of get these like deep any sort of deep-seated sort of traumatic um, feelings out they claim they have the scientific um, studies for it but it was so close um, to this sensation that there has to be something there has to be something specifically um, in that region that we can maybe think about so if we have someone alienated from their own body who's having involuntary tremors after um, after being through um, some trauma, this is where the dancing comes in, um, how can we think then of the slightly more positive, happy types of um, physical activity uh, that happen within, within the novel? So I want to look at the different kinds of them. I'm going to start with dancing and then I'm going to finish off with, um, with running and thinking about that. So I want to think how br the 
bursts of physical activity that we get in the novel can act as a temporary release from the inertia of living within a geographically confined area during a violent conflict. Now, throughout the novel, bodies are constrained by the spatial and behavioural limits placed both by gender norms but also by violent conflict. As Middle Sister moves through the city, she's acutely aware of which areas are dangerous and plans her running and walking routes carefully to avoid both unwanted male attention but also no-go areas. Now, in the novel, as I've said, the three main kinds of physical activity represented are walking, often while reading, running and dancing. Now, dancing is mostly explored through the depiction of maybe boyfriend's parents who left their young family for professional ballroom dancing careers. They had to escape the rigid moral climate of Northern Ireland in order to fulfil these ambitions. Now, Middle Sister muses on how certain categories of people are able to transcend the sectarian binary because of their talent. Now, what's interesting to me are the people that she mentions are mostly people, the people on stage and screen, sports people, often people who use their bodies in different ways. Now, all of these activities involve physical prowess and stamina. It seems the exceptional body is afforded a kind of other space due to the emotional effects, the affective changes they produce in people. Sports, dance and entertainment are designed to stoke emotions and fuel empathy. Here, the body is a conduit to something beyond the inert present. In particular, Burns emphasises the physicality of the dancer. With those eyes, that face, that body, the mobility, the confidence, the sensuality. Now, this seems at direct odds with the cowed, small, bent over, contracted stance of the anti orgasm. Dancers emphasize posture, and I will talk about running and posture in a second, but dancers very much emphasize that kind of upright posture. Within the narrative then, the discussion of the dancers offers movement, colour and rhythm, which functions in the narrative to disturb the relentless grind of negative pressure that we've talked about. Now, middle sister's younger siblings are captivated by their performance. And now we sisters were explaining the joy that was to be had from playing Mr and Mrs International. Now, to dance then can be an avowedly political act, especially in a society where movement is so rigorously policed. And dance has a variety of cultural meanings. It can be a collective act of solidarity or one of individual defiance. Now, it's not, obviously not just in the community that we perceive Middle Sister um, and Burns to be from, that, that dance um, is a taboo as well. And, and Jan, this is, this is your bit where we'll all take you for a dance afterwards. Um, in 2001 then, um, Ian Paisley declared that dance was sinful. The dancing of the world, hugging the other sex, set to music, is sensual and clearly caters to the lust of the flesh. Line dancing is as sinful as any other type of dancing. With its sexual gestures and touching, it is sensual, not a crucifying of lust, but an excitement of lust. It is a war against the soul. Now, this taboo over movement is explored in an essay by John Carson, No Dancing, where she examines her complex relationship with the faith of her youth and how this influenced her relationship with the body in motion. She identifies in particular a, a tightness in, in her body that she describes as the legacy of an upbringing where there was a huge taboo around moving for pleasure. Every time I dance, I feel constrained. I feel as if every part of me is ludicrous and I need to sit down. I feel as if I'm veering dangerously close to being out of control and I can't cope with this feeling. Now here the experience um, is linked in many ways um, to feelings of, um, of shame and shame around the body. Um, but the, it, it ends on this, the essay ends on this lovely um, hopeful note where we're told, you know, the tightness is slowly losing its hold. I can't dance yet, but I'm getting there. So like Middle Sister, the movement um, becomes this sort of way out of this kind of, this tightness, this, this, this smallness. And I want to talk then about what does it mean to be a Northern Irish dancing body? What does it mean to, to move um, rhythmically in some of these ways? So Sarah Ahmed, in discussing Emma Goldman's famous assertion that I won't join your revolution if I cannot dance, sets out the politics of choosing to dance when your body is coded as either a victim or perpetrator. 
Goldman affirms at this moment dance is an effective rebellion against the requirement to be mournful, against the requirement not to live in her body through joyful abandon. This is what I call an affect alien movement. A killjoy survival guide is also about allowing your body to be the site of a rebellion, including a rebellion against the demand to give your body over to a cause or to make your body a cause. Now, Milkman, we can see these small moments of rebellion through movement. Um, another example of this is, of course, um, the, the final um, scene of series one of Dairy Girls, where the, where the girls dance to like a prayer while news of a terrorist attack reaches their families. The gut-wrenching effective power of the scene that we saw so many people kind of reacting to, especially on social media, comes in the juxtaposition of fear with the joy that comes from fully inhabiting your body. In the same way, we sisters find joy and pleasure in unselfconscious dancing. And I couldn't resist putting a picture here of Strictly Ballroom, which was one of my most important films to me um, in the 1990s and ported down, so you're indulging me because I'm up here. Um, so um, she talks about this joy and pleasure in unselfconscious dancing. This explained the colour, for there had been an explosion of colour, plus fabric, accessories, makeup, feathers, plumes, tiaras, beads, sparkles, tassels, lace, ribbons, ruffles, layered petticoats, lipsticks, eyeshadows, even fur. I had glimpsed fringed fur, high heels too, which belonged to the little girl's big sisters and which didn't fit them, which was why periodically the little girls fell over, sustaining injury. But the thing is, reiterated we, we sisters, and you don't seem to be overjoyed by this middle sister, you get to be her every time. Now the spectacle is for themselves alone. Both dancers da dance as the female partner. The dancing body refuses, even for a short while, to participate in conflict. Now in the particular style of dancing that the wee sisters are attracted to, ballroom dancing, one partner takes the lead and the other shadows their movements. But the spectacle they're creating here is avowedly queer. An almost drag pageantry of femininity where everyone wants to be the woman and the roles are easily reversed. In their childish play, they represent a movement that is unavailable to many of the adults in the novel. Now Ahmed discusses the bodies that prance, the bodies that dance, Bodies that matter, to borrow Judith Butler's terms. Bodies that have to wiggle about to create space. So to move your body for pleasure is to assert that you think that you matter. And in this text, the difference between we sisters' pleasurable movement and middle sisters' oscillation between running and painful paralysis is acute. So the last bit that I want to talk about um, today, the last sort of section of this paper is on running. And, and we know that Middle Sister um, starts the novel running, ends the novel running, um, and at various different points has this kind of relationship with, with her own body in, in that sort of a way. So throughout the novel, Middle Sister's emotional state can be directly linked with her running activity. She curtails her runs when she's faced with the milkman's unwanted attentions. She seeks solace and recovery in it after she has been freed from them. Running bookends the novel and we can trace her state of mind against her physical activity. Now she becomes more and more intimidated by the milkman. Her relationship to her own body changes as does her relationship to the local area. I was finding myself more and more circumscribed into an incoherent, debilitated place. Now, this identifies how a coercive mood changes the body and mental state, and a combination of sexual and sectarian violence causes the world to become smaller for middle sister. Physical activity offers her a way to kind of rumble out of a dense, he heavy, effective landscape and to create some space. Now, runners often aim for a lightness of stroke and a feeling of buoyancy, but running also requires a great sense of your own body. Running requires a lot of self-knowledge and awareness to manage everything from gait to timings to warding off injury. Can you tell I'm a field runner? Um, the sort of the sense of the body um, in space that we have discussed. Now, Middle Sister's appetite for long distance running offers her the same kind of escapism that she finds in reading. Now, Burns has noted in an interview that I had always been quite fit yoga and hiking and elsewhere in an interview um, talks, about, talks about her running as well. And around the time the novel was set, we also have um, Mary Peters, another one of these um, exceptional um, people from Northern Ireland, winning the gold medal in the women's pentathlon in Munich in 1974. Why running then? 
So running then, um, in addition to the cardiovascular and the sort of the well-noted mental health benefits, running offers a different viewpoint on one's local area. So I met my family for lunch on, on Sunday and I was talking to them about, about giving this paper. Incidentally, my mum thinks this is the worst novel she's ever read. Um, it's fine. Um, she tends to read things that, 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 I, um, that I write about, but um, she's, she's given up on this one. Um, but they were talking a lot about the sort of the explosion in um, park runs and they've become these sort of park run tourists to go to other people. Um, park runs and how that has changed for them and um, the views of different parts of the city as well and I was telling them about this novel and then they were they were actually talking me through where you go and kind of the waterworks um, park run um, as well which was great but running offers a different viewpoint on your local area a middle sister doesn't just have the mental maps of sectarian geography in her head she mingles this with a spatial awareness when she's planning a run she always wants to get in a long enough run she wants to properly exercise her own body so she must balance caution with the desire to, to, to really run her body as much as she wants to. So she plots out a running route carefully in order to get a long distance run in with the pressures of rooting around the sectarian geography of 1970s North Belfast. She says, if you didn't, you were left with a curtailed route owing to religious geography, which meant repeatedly going around a much smaller area in order to get a comparable effect. Now she is determined, however, to keep moving. That's the thing that always gets me. Like she wants to go for a run. She wants to get out. She wants to joyously move her own body. Now, in an extension of this process that caused the anti-orgasm, that idea of recoil, whenever I think of the anti-orgasm, I just think of someone kind of, you know, kind of bent, you know, kind of bent over, kind of hunched over. And her process of bodily recoil then presents her from doing physical activity. Then my legs hurt, so the bit by bit I pulled out of my runs with third brother-in-law. First it was the odd run, then more and more cancellations as the pain continued and a lack of coordination overtook me. It came that I couldn't anymore relax and feel myself in flow. Like the language of inflow with someone that, that, you know, that, that has a regular kind of body and meditation practice. Couldn't breathe properly. Where before the act of running brought breath through me, kept me in touch, filled me up. Now, as middle sister notes here, running brought breath through her. That's something that in, in light on yoga, obviously anyone who, who practices yoga knows that that process of, of breathing is, is so vital. The idea of bringing breath through me, I think, is really transformative. Rather than depleting her, a run kind of makes her come alive. She spends so much of the novel mute and still, where the running body is fast, the running body breathes heavily, the running body is in control of itself. Now, one of the most vital muscles um, for running, um, again, this is, this is how I'm going to get that, that sweet medical humanities money, is the psoas, because I have diagrams of body parts, um, is the psoas. So the psoas um, essentially um, connects the upper part of your body with the bottom part of your body. It's just this muscle that, that runs down here. It's basically thanks to the psoas that you're able to kind of bend, if you can bend, um, and get back up again. Um, and this part of the body is obviously particularly active whenever, um, whenever you're running. Now, we have like... You know the, the kind of the, the, the kind of the pubic cradle, and we have the, the the sacral nerve as well that comes down there, which is where seems to be the, the locus of some of the sensations um, that that she's having. But the psoas is engaged every time you pull up a knee to run, like every time you pull up a knee. So instead of having this muscle which is contracting and shuddering, running allows it to be stretched and used in an entirely different way. Running offers a different kind of engagement with this pelvic region. Rather than the dark shutters of recoil, in running, the pelvis should be engaged, neutral and stable. It allows her an entirely changed relationship with her own body. Whenever she's in that state of anti-orgasm, it contracts everything away down. Now, the very last paragraph of the novel um, is often read by many readers as inspiring um, a sense of hope, um, where we hear... So that was settled. We fell back to stretching, which is when the others, amused by our little passage until they were bored by our little passage, pushed us out of this stretching. Meanwhile, we too resumed our stretching. Then brother-in-law said, right, are you right? And I said, aye, come on, we'll do it. As we jumped the tiny hedge, because we couldn't be bothered with the tiny gate to set off on our running, I inhaled the early evening light and realised this was softening, what others might term a little softening. Then landing on the pavement in the direction of the parks and reservoirs, I exhaled this light and for a moment, just a moment, I almost nearly laughed. 
Now, Sarah Ahmed in Living a Feminist Life talks about how sort of an, an awareness um, of, of, of one's own self allows you to re-inhabit your own body. And as we noted, Middle Sister had an instinctive relationship to her own body and her own feelings before her sustained harassment. What we see here is a kind of a homecoming, a return to herself through a relationship with the body in motion. What does it mean then to come back to the body after a time spent under duress? How does it feel? And although he was writing about capitalism and economic crash, I think Mark Fisher's comment is useful here. From a situation in which nothing can happen, suddenly everything is possible again. So through Middle Sister's body, we can chart the cumulative effect of sectarian violence and sexual harassment to make the world smaller, to make the body more constrained. And the reader can clearly see how, in being ground down, we can lose our relationship with what we know to be true. As Middle Sister runs through the parks and reservoirs, almost nearly laughing, and that this is a tiny thing that we're like basing um, any sort of a, a feeling of, of hope on, we see sort of a we, we see a breathing out. Um, we know from our vantage point that if we kind of date the novel um, around the early 1970s, we know that the violence of the Troubles will go on for 20 more years. We know through the text of the novel that, that many of her friends um, have been murdered as well. But something in her exhalation of light, something in her breathing out, something in her homecoming to her own body um, finally allows the reader a chance to breathe out. Thanks. <laughs>